Income tax 2023-2024 rental property special situations renting part of property not rented for profit and example of change to rental use. Get ready and some coffee so we can recognize the code cracks when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because Apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in publication 527 residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Noting the rental property reported on schedule E ultimately rolls into line one income of the income tax formula. The first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement where we have income minus, instead of calling them expenses, we call them deductions, resulting in, instead of calling it net income, taxable income. The Schedule E rental property, similarly to the Schedule C business property, is basically an income statement in and of itself, having rental income minus rental expenses, resulting in, in essence, net rental income, which is what rolls in from the Schedule E to line one income of the income tax formula. This income tax formula outlining the calculation on the Form 1040 of which we see page one, the income section, the Schedule E ultimately rolling into line eight, additional income from Schedule 1, line 10. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, part number one, additional income, the Schedule E rolling into line five, rental, real estate, royalties, etc., etc., from the Schedule E. This is the Schedule E, supplemental income and loss from rental, real estate, royalties, etc., etc., where we have, in essence, an income statement format broken out by rental property. So this, now we're gonna be thinking about the odd scenarios, noting the baseline scenario, what we always want to be comparing and contrasting back to the baseline scenario being, we imagine we have a home. We have a second home, but we're not using it as a second home or even rental property in the base scenario. We're simply using it purely as rental property, allowing us to separate our business between the rental property, which we're considering kind of like a business, in essence, the bookkeeping being separate from our personal bookkeeping and thinking about the income statement related to it, rental income minus rental expenses, which includes things such as the depreciation of the property, at least the depreciation related to the building part of the property because the land can't be depreciated, as well as mortgage interest, and so on and so forth. So now we're going to compare and contrast that to more complicated scenarios where possibly we have an interest, uh, personal and business, in the property, which means that, remember, the income side of things is usually still pretty straightforward. It's the expense side of things that's going to get messed up, meaning if I have some kind of personal use of the property, either I have my property and I'm renting part of it, as we saw in a prior presentation, or I have a separate property which I live in for part of the time, possibly it's vacation home or something like that, and I rent it part of the time, the income I get from it still is not a problem because obviously I'm only gonna get income from the part of the property where it's generating income, the rental use of the property, and the IRS is gonna want their piece of the income. It's the expenses that is gonna be the problem because I can't allocate the expenses. If I repaired the house, it's gonna be difficult to allocate just the part of the house that it was repaired for rental use, unless it was like a property that was split between rental and personal and I repaired just the rental part of it. 
But usually, if you repair the house, then you're going to apply it to the whole house and have to use some kind of ratio analysis to break out the amount that's going to be going for the business versus the amount that's going to be for personal. Also, the depreciation becomes a problem because now we can only really get a depreciation deduction for the part of the house that's rental rather than personal or the part uh, of, the, of the usage of the house that's rental uh, versus personal, for example. So that's what we'll touch in here. We always want to compare and contrast this again to the baseline scenario where we are able to break out cleanly the rental property from the personal property and then add your details, your complications in from there. Again, those complications typically being on the expense side of things. All right, renting part of property. So if you rent part of your property, you must divide certain expenses between the part of the property used for rental purposes and the part of the property used for personal purposes as though you actually had two separate pieces of property. So from a bookkeeping standpoint, this kind of makes sense because remember on bookkeeping, even if it's not a separate corporate entity, we have the concept of saying, I want to keep my business separate from the personal. That's going to allow us to focus in on business related items, personal related items, make financial statements for both of them separately so that we can help to achieve the separate goals, the personal goals being separate than the business goals. Clearly for taxes, we have a similar concept, but from the IRS's perspective, we want to separate out the business property because the IRS is thinking of themselves as the silent partner, and that's the money generation part of your activities, and they want a piece of it. So we have to then separate those two things out in some way, shape, or form, and that problem happens on the expense side of things. So you can deduct the expenses related to the part of the property used for rental purposes, such as home mortgage interest and real estate taxes as rental expenses on Schedule E. So remember that you cannot generally, from an income tax perspective, if you just had an income tax and you're thinking what kind of things should be deductible, it wouldn't be all the stuff on the Schedule A. That's all strange all the stuff on the itemized deductions, the first thing that would come to mind is I should be able to deduct those things I had to consume in order to generate revenue, which we can see most clearly on the business properties such as Schedule E and Schedule C, where the deductions make sense from a natural income statement perspective because those were ordinary necessary expenses that needed to be consumed in order to generate the revenue. Whereas we're used to seeing deductions that really are strange and are more of political maneuvering and, and uh, po political types of things and interest groups lobbying and whatnot, meaning most of the stuff on like the Schedule A itemized deductions is trying the government trying to give you stuff or this or that or trying to nudge you to behave this way or the other way with the help and the use of the tax code. So those things are important to know, but when we get to the business side of things, it's actually more naturally lining up to what you would expect to be kind of deductible. So that means that when we talk about mortgage interest, you might be thinking, well, of course you get to deduct the mortgage interest and the real estate taxes because they're usually deducted on the itemized deduction schedule A. But again, that's weird because if it was your personal residence, then you would think it would be per those would be personal expenses. You wouldn't get a deduction for them. If it was rental property, then because the property is geared towards generating revenue, you would think you would be able to because those were ordinary and necessary expenses necessary to generate revenue. But what if you use it both for personal and rental? Then you have to break out the the deductions in some way, shape, or form. So you can also deduct as rental expenses a portion of other expenses that, that are normally non-deductible personal expenses, such as expenses for the electricity or painting the outside of the house. So if it was your personal residence, you, don't, you get a deduction for mortgage interest and real estate taxes, possibly on the Schedule A if you're itemizing, but not for other things, not for like depreciation, not for painting the house, repairing the house, doing the electricity, all that kind of stuff. And you, if it was rental property and not personal property, you would think you would get a deduction for those things because they needed to be done in order to generate the rental revenue. So there is no change in the type of expenses deductible for the personal use part of your property. 
So the part of the property that is for personal use, you still don't get to deduct that part for painting that part of the house is the general idea because it's personal, not business. Generally, these expenses may be deducted only if you itemize your deduction on Schedule A, meaning you might still get the mortgage interest and the property taxes if it qualified as your personal residence on the Schedule A as basically your home, for example. You can't deduct any part of the cost of the first phone line even if your tenants have unlimited use of it. So you, that might be more or less uh, relevant these days given the fact that the cell phones are kind of taking over the world of the phones. You don't have to divide the expenses that belong only to the rental part of your property. For example, if you paint a room that you rent or pay premiums for liability insurance in connection with renting a room in your home, your entire cost is a rental expense. In other words, you've got the property you're using both for personal and rental. The part of the property that is the rental part is the part you painted. Well, then you don't have to allocate the expense between personal and business because you painted the rental part. But if you painted the entire home and you paid for the entire cost of the painting, not per room, but by the entire home, then you would think you would have to allocate it between the personal and business for the cost of that. So if you install a second phone line strictly for your tenant's use, all the cost of the second line is deductible as a rental expense. You can deduct depreciation on the part of the house used for rental purposes, as well as the furniture and equipment you use for rental purposes. So the house is going to be the big one because if it was your personal residence, it's not on the books and being depreciated because you don't get a tax benefit. But you might get a tax benefit, of course, if it were rental property, you would think you'd be able to put that portion of the property on the books and get a benefit of the depreciation. Remembering that depreciation is basically lowering the cost of the property, the basis of the property as you consume it, kind of like potential energy. You're consuming part of the potential energy. It's going down, which means that you're more likely to result in a gain when you sell the property, which wouldn't be as big a problem oftentimes if it was personal property because you might have this huge exemption. But if part of the property is rental, that could mess up the whole like exemption thing. So another thing to keep you know, in mind with with that. So how to divide expenses. So how does this work in, in us? Get down to the nitty, get down to the gritty. That's what we want to see here. So if an expense is for both rental use and personal use, such as mortgage interest or heat for the entire house, you must divide the expense between rental use and personal use. So now, of course, you've got the breakout of the entire home you're paying expenses on, but only part of it is personal. We have to do some kind of rational breakout between the business and personal. You can use any reasonable method for dividing the expenses. So we have some leeway. How would that do that? We need some rational method that we can use to justify in the event of an audit. So it may be reasonable to divide the cost of some items, so, uh, for example, water based on the number of people. So from a managerial standpoint, this would be called like an activity base kind of system. In other words, what what is the ratio that we can use to be allocating out the bill? If you're talking about like the water usage, you would think that the water usage might be most easily based on the number of people. So if you have one person and you're renting to two other people, you would think two thirds of the bill might go to them because two out of three are using the water. You're only one person versus uh, the, the other two, right? Uh, but might not might not work so well if you got one of those clean freaks or something that washes their hands every two seconds, then, then you know, He's probably consuming a lot. That guy's kind of crazy. He's, he's consuming a lot of water over there. But normally that might be one way that uh, that you can do it. Uh, so the two most common methods of dividing an expense are one, the number of rooms in your home and two, the square footage. So the square for most things, the square footage is probably the default method that you would might be most accurate. The number of rooms could be accurate but in where I live, for example, the rooms are a lot different in size. So you would think that might not be the most accurate way if I'm trying to allocate the heat bill or electricity 
because it's being used in the heat and the in the cold or whatever, then you would think that the person with the larger room is going to consume more of it or something like that, right? Whereas if you did it by a square footage, you would think that that would be more reasonable. So if you put a new, if you if you if you did anything, painted the whole home, or you've got utilities in the home, you might use like a square footage and say, well, this is the square footage of the room compared to the square footage of the home. That's a little bit more difficult because you probably have the square footage of the home because it's on the, when you purchased it, it's probably on, on Zillow or whatever those, you know, the home sales websites or whatever, and on your purchase contract possibly, but you have to then get the, the square footage of the rooms and that can be a little bit more difficult. Uh, the easiest thing is to do it by room. And then some things you might say, hey, look, it's it would be more reasonable for me not to do it by room because possibly for whatever reason, you've got like five people packed in one room. <laughs> and I don't think that's legal in a lot of places, but let's just imagine you got five people packed in a room and then and then that that would mean with the water bill, you would think by room wouldn't be the way to go because the five people are using the water versus the one person that's using the rest of the house, I guess. That's it, right. So that's why if you were to have a question with an IRS auditor, you'd say, hey, look, I didn't do it by room for the water bill because five people are packed into this room, <laughs> this room. So I did it by person in that case or something. So that's the activity base that you would use. But the default is usually going to be square footage, in my opinion. So example, so you rent a home in your house. The room is 12 by 15 feet or 180 square feet. So your entire house is 1,800 square feet. So the one, so the 12 by 15, you might have to pull out an actual ruler and figure that out, or at least estimate it. The 1,800 square feet is probably known to you or easily findable in the purchase documents, or if you look it up on when the house was sold on the websites or whatever. You can deduct as a rental expense 10% of any expenses that must uh, be divided between the rental and personal use because we're dividing 1,180 by 1,800, 10%. So if your heating bill for the year for the entire house was $600, $60, which is 600 times the 10% or 0.1 is rental expense, the balance 150 is a personal expense that you can't deduct because it's personal. A duplex. Now we have a duplex situation. A common situation is the duplex where you live in one unit and rent out the other. So that's going to be a common situation because it's nice and convenient to say, hey, look, I'd like to have a rental property that's easy for me to manage. So it's close by. I'll live in the, the one bit and they and they, they the other one is rented out and I can service that nice and easy because I'm close by. Although I have to make sure I don't put someone in there who's renting the property, who's crazy, because that will make my life more difficult because I'm connected, I'm like right next to them. So certain expenses apply to the entire property, such as mortgage interest and real estate taxes, and must be split to determine rental and personal use expenses. Example, so you own a duplex and you live in one half, renting out the other half. Both units are approximately the same size. Last year, you paid a total of $10,000 mortgage interest and 2,000 real estate taxes for the entire property. You can deduct 5,000 because they're about the same size. So like 50%, 5,000 mortgage interest, 1,000 real estate taxes on the Schedule E, not the Schedule A, Schedule E, rental property. <clears throat> so if you itemize your deductions, include the other 5,000 mortgage interest and 1,000 real estate taxes when figuring the amount you can deduct on Schedule A. In other words, you're paying for the whole property and the part that's for the rental property would be deducted on the Schedule E. And if you're itemizing, you might still be able to deduct them because that's your principal residence on the Schedule A, which would be the real estate taxes and mortgage interest. So not rented for profit. What if we have a situation where it's not rented for profit? Remembering that the rental property, there's multiple reasons you might be holding on to it. You want to have a hedge against inflation. So you want to own the land. You're hoping it goes up 
and just real est- and just the real estate just goes up in terms of the equity because of the scarcity of land or possibly the location that's in it because you've got some inside information that there's going to be a cool new like shopping center right next to it and now it's going to go I don't know but that you're hoping it's going to go up there so you might be willing to basically take a loss on it and you also run into these situations where basically family members want to live in the property and you're renting to like some like one of, like one of your kids or something and obviously they can't pay the rent like on the market value or something like that so you have this weird situation with those kind of personal situations and whatnot so in any case So if you don't rent your property to make a profit, you can't deduct rental expenses in excess of the amount of your rental income. So now, obviously, the idea of renting the property from the government's perspective, they're like, hey, look, I'm your silent partner. What you're supposed to be doing is renting the property to make a profit so that we could take some of it. And so you can't you can't rent the property and not try to make a profit and then make a loss and then take that loss against other income. No, 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 says the IRS, right? They are, they're only in it for the, for the profit side of things. So you can see how they'd be, that would annoy them. So you can't deduct a loss or carry forward the next year any rental expenses that are more than your rental income for the year. So where to report? Report your not-for-profit rental income on Schedule N, uh, Form 1040, Line 8J. If you itemize your deductions, include your mortgage interest if you use the property as your main home or second home. Real estate taxes and casualty losses from the not-for-profit rental activity when figuring the amount you can deduct on Schedule A. Uh, Presumption of profit. If your rental income is more than your rental expenses for at least three years out of a period of five consecutive years, you are presumed to to be renting for property Uh, to make a profit. So note the situation here. This is kind of similar to the situation where you have the Schedule C business. And the question is, from the IRS's perspective, is it a hobby or is it a for-profit engagement? Now, if it is a for-profit engagement, you might still have losses, especially in the first few years. That's very common. And then you might be able to take those losses against other income or possibly future income, which makes sense because you had to build up your business, taking the hit in the few, few years so that you can make money in the later years and so on. So that you would think those you should get a tax benefit for that. But if it was a hobby, the IRS is going to say, hey, look, you're losing money all the time. Yeah, you make some revenue, but you keep on losing money because like you're a photographer and you're just like taking pictures and you make a little bit of revenue by putting them on, you know, whatever the social sites or something. But then you keep on writing off a loss and we don't like that. We want to take some of your income. We don't want to take part of your hobby losses. Right. And so a similar thing happens here where you, if you want it to be a for-profit business where you get the deductions, then typically you have to rent it out for the fair market value, which becomes complex when you're dealing, especially with like relatives and situations like that, because the IRS, of course, could suspect with related party transactions that it's not an arm's length transaction. So the so what you want to do with the rental property is typically try to try to your best make it so that you're renting it out at an arm's length fair market value amount so that you can claim it, the deductions related to it as business or rental expense deductions, uh, rather rather than not being able to do that would be the, the general idea. Now, if you did have losses, the, remember, like the concept of the law in the legal system is you're innocent until proven guilty. That's not exactly the same for taxes, right? So taxes, oftentimes they might presume that you, you know, the presumptions could be different. But with this case, you have the general presumption being if they came back and audited you because you had losses, the presumption is that you're innocent in proving and in, in saying that it was for profit business for three years. So the, the your rental, so your rental income is more than your rental uh, expenses for at least three years out of five, the presumption of profit meaning they're going to at least look at it from the perspective that that they have to prove that you weren't in it for profit rather than the other way around. But if you had losses for five consecutive years, then they're going to say, hey, 
this we're going to come at this from the perspective of it's not profitable. So they changed kind of like the idea of that's that postponing decision. So if you are starting your rental activity and don't have three years showing a profit, you can elect to have the presumption made after you have the five years of experience required by the test. So you may choose to postpone the decision of whether the rental is for profit by filing form 5213. You must file form 5213 within three years after the due date of your return determined without extensions for the year in which you first carried on the activity or if earlier within 60 days after receiving written notice from the IRS proposing to disallow deductions attributable to the activity. Example property changed to rental use. So this is just going to be an example of the property change to rental use. So in January, you bought a condominium apartment to live in. Instead of selling the house you had, you had been living in, you decided to change it to rental property. You uh, selected a tenant and started renting the house on February 1st. So it was personal residence. You moved out and, and you, you're going to change that to rental property. So you charge $750 a month for rent and collect it yourself. You also receive a $750 security deposit from the tenant. So you're going to get the deposit, which of course you're usually going to be reporting then if it's not the last month rent, but rather a deposit, meaning you have to give it back to them unless they mess up the place, which typically you're never going to give it back to them. Let's be honest, but no, <laughs> but the idea is you'd give it back when they when they move out of the place basically if they haven't wrecked the place so therefore it's not going to be income in that case you would think but rather a liability from a bookkeeping standpoint so because you plan to return it to your tenant at the end of the lease you don't include it in your income your rental expenses for the year are as follows so you got the mortgage interest 1800 fire insurance for a one-year policy, $100, miscellaneous repairs that you had to put in place after renting, 297 So real estate taxes, and notice it have to say after renting here, because if you if you did the repairs uh, before renting, then, then the question is, would that be part of the rental property that you had to put together to put it in use, right? Whereas if it's after renting, you would think it would, it would clearly be a rental uh, expense real estate taxes imposed and paid 1200 so you must divide the real estate taxes mortgage interest and fire insurance between the personal use of the property and the rental use of the property you can deduct 11 twelfths of these expenses as rental expenses because it's been rental property for 11 twelfths of the year i believe you can include the balance of the real estate taxes and mortgage interest when figuring the amount you can deduct on schedule a in other words you change the property from personal your principal residence to rental property so the amount of the year that it was rental property for mortgage interest and real estate taxes, we deduct on the Schedule E, whereas in the prior year, we still got a deduction for it, but it was on the Schedule A if we were itemizing because the itemized deductions were greater than the standard deduction. Now, we have partially personal, partially business. The amount that's personal or rental, the amount that's personal could possibly still give us a benefit on the Schedule A. However, less likely that it will if our Schedule A deductions drop down below the standard deduction amount. In any case, you can't deduct the balance of the fire insurance because it is a personal expense. So that so on the personal side, we don't get to deduct the personal part of the insurance. So you bought this house in 2008 for $35,000. So your property taxes uh, was based on assessed values of $10,000 for the land and $25,000 for the house. So we bought the home. So now the question is, I want to take the depreciation of the home, but I didn't just buy it. I bought it way back when 2008 for $35,000. And so what am I going to put it on the books at? Remember, it's going to be the lower of the adjusted basis or the fair market value. And then we're going to have to break out between personal and I mean, sorry, land and building the building being the part that we can depreciate. All right, 
So before changing it to rental property, you added several improvements to the house. Note, these improvements are things that you probably haven't been documenting as closely as you might otherwise do, given the fact that you don't get a deduction for it when it was a personal residence. So you have to go back and make sure that you're picking up the cost of the property and the proper improvements to see if it's greater than the current fair market value so you can put it on the books properly as rental property. So you figure your adjusted basis as follows. So the house was 25,000. Uh, the, the remodel kitchen, 4,200. The recreation room, 5,800. So the new roof, uh, 1,600. By the way, this 35,000 was broken out between the the business and personal. So notice sometimes it will not be the exact same number on the property tax statement. The property tax assessment, in other words, might have a different number than what you actually bought the property for, but you can use the ratio then in order to break out between building and interest. So whatever the ratio is between land, sorry, land and building, on the property tax statement, if it was you know third you know 30, 70, 30, you can uh, you can take that same ratio and apply it to what your actual cost was, right? In any case, so that's the kitchen, recreation room, the patio and deck we added to that. So we're we're coming out to thirty nine thousand, and then on February first, when you changed your house. Uh, to rental property, the property had a fair market value of 152,000. Wow. Of this amount, 35,000 was for land. So it was 117,000 was for the house. So, be, and that's often going to be the case because the property hopefully will retain its value. Fair market value hopefully went up. So when we're comparing the fair market value to the cost, it might be often the case where the lesser amount is going to be the cost or it would be the adjusted basis in cost. So because your adjusted basis is less than the fair market value, on the date of the change, you use 39,000 as your basis for depreciation. As specified for residential rental property, you must use the straight line method of depreciation over the GDS or ADS recovery period. So in other words, now that we know what to put it on the books for, we're gonna usually use software and the software is going to force us to put it into the category of usually a GDS property, maker's property, which is going to use a straight line depreciation mid-month conviction over 27.5 years. So use table 2-2D to find your depreciation percent because you placed the property in service in February. The percentage is 3.5. 182. So on April 1st, you bought a new dishwasher for the rental property at a cost of $425. The dishwasher is personal property used in a rental real estate activity, which has five year recovery period. So in other words, the new dishwasher, I can't just expense it because it's part of equipment. And according to the tax code, we're saying it's a five year property which is going to be on there's makers five years, which is typically a double declining balance depreciation method. Tax software will help us to calculate it, typically a mid or half year convention. You use table 2-2A to find the depreciation percentage for year one under the half year convention, 20% to figure your depreciation deduction. On May 1st, you paid $4,000 to have a furnace installed in the house. The, furzen, the furnace is residential rental property because you placed the property in service in May. The depreciation percent from the table 2-2 two is 2.273. Again, tax software will help us do the calculation once we have the property, property proper category for the property. So you figure your net rental income and loss for the house as follows. So here's our little income statement, which would basically be the Schedule E. We're going to populate this into the Schedule E. If we were doing bookkeeping in like a QuickBooks situation, the rental income would be easy for us to follow if using a cash-based uh, kind of system, uh, bank feeds, because we'd get the income typically of 8250 which would be the 750 
times 11, not including the cash that we got for the security deposit, which in a bookkeeping system would be cash we received, but not recorded as revenue, but rather as deposits or unearned revenue, a liability that would be in our books on the balance sheet, balance sheets not being reported on the tax return. However, you do have the balance sheet account of the asset account of property, plants, and equipment so that we can record the depreciation from the depreciation schedules. All right, the expenses, the mortgage interest. Now, if I was doing this in a bookkeeping system, we would see the mortgage, in the property payments being paid, and we could break out the mortgage part of it versus the principal part, the principal part reducing the loan, which is a balance sheet account, the other part of it recording the mortgage interest. It's also something that you could do from a bookkeeping perspective on a yearly basis, making the bank feeds as easy as possible. And then at the end of the year, you adjust it according to the, the uh, 1098 that you will receive reporting mortgage interest and according to the amortization table at the end of the year. Another method you can use, we talk about that more in our, our accounting courses, if you wanna look at those. So fire insurance, 11 twelfths of the fire insurance when we pay the fire insurance again that's something that would come through the bookkeeping on a cash-based system which would be easy for us to track miscellaneous repairs similarly would be easiest for us to track on a cash-based system if we paid cash and used a, a bookkeeping system on bank feeds real estate taxes also fairly easy for us to track in a bookkeeping system to track the uh, real estate taxes and then we have the items that are not related or not tracked by a cash-based system by the bookkeeping, the house being depreciated. Obviously, the home we bought before, so we didn't pay any cash for it, but we took the basis and put it on the books. This is something that would be calculated by the software and would be a tax adjustment that we would then add on the tax side of things, not from the bookkeeping side of things that would typically be done by the, the bookkeeper, right? So then we have a dishwasher and a furnace. These are things that when the bookkeeper saw those, when we see them on the bookkeeping side, we might have asked the tax preparer or asked ourselves and said, hey, are these things that are gonna be expenses or are they things that are gonna have to be depreciated? If they're things that have to be depreciated, we would put them on the books possibly as a fixed asset and then allow the tax preparer to put them in the software as a fixed asset and then the software would then calculate the expense in the form of depreciation related to, uh, to them. Also, from a tax preparing standpoint, we might look at, for example, the, the repairs and maintenance accounts to see if they included things like a dishwasher and a furnace or something, which should have been things that should be capitalized as just like a quick review when we're doing our accounting. So that's going to give us to the net rental income for the house of $3,694, uh, basically the bottom line of the Schedule E. So you use Schedule E Part 1 to report your rental income and expenses. You enter your income, expenses, and depreciation for the house in the column for Property A. Because all property was placed in service this year, you must use Form 4562 to figure the depreciation. See the instructions for Form 4562 for more information on preparing the form.